If you like Tony Soprano, uh, you'll like these books, okay? Um, one is called Bone in the Throat. Uh, the other's called Bobby Gold. They're written by another Tony, actually. Uh, they're set around the murky world of restaurant kitchens. Bet you didn't think that restaurant kitchens were all that murky, did you? Well, you don't know the half of it. Will you welcome, please, New York chef and whistleblower, Anthony Bourdain. Anthony, you're very welcome. Thanks. Well, you, you are a novelist, that's for sure. We talk about that side of you, but you are a chef. I mean, a fully fledged veteran chef. Yeah, I spent uh, started as a dishwasher at age seventeen and worked my way up the line uh, over twenty eight years, and have been a chef for I guess about fifteen years now. Fifteen years. Okay. Was there any moment when you decided, yes, this is the life for me? Uh, really early in my career, I like a lot of people. Uh, well, the, the restaurant business has always been sort of a refuge for for misfits and, and refugees, particularly back in the seventies and eighties when I started. And I started uh, working a dishwashing job when my housemates got sick of me freeloading off them. Uh, started washing dishes, and I looked across the line at uh, the cooks and uh, the people who worked in the kitchen. I thought, you know, these guys live like like pirate kings. I mean, they had, they got you know, girls and uh, free liquor and free food, and they lived like basically like like rock and roll bands. Uh, and they didn't even have to play guitar. Uh, there was if there was one particular moment, I got to try to you know. Of a phrase this delicately. I was washing dishes and it was a large wedding party and the restaurant uh, coming right after the ceremony. The bride, the groom, the bride in her wedding whites. And uh, at one point during uh, the meal with the whole wedding party out in the dining room, the bride poked her head in the kitchen, had a whispered conversation with the chef, and the two of them disappeared off into the parking lot, into the yeah. trash area where we keep the trash separated from the parking lot. And all the cooks started looking out the window, and there is my chef uh, making love to the bride in her wedding gown, uh, while her, the new groom and the whole family are out in the dining room uh, chawing away on fried seafood. And I thought, uh, well, my first thought was, I want to be a chef. Um, and uh, that was, so that was my kind of early epiphany that, that urged me on to, uh, you know, to work yeah. hard and rise was, up the line. It was a rocky road, though, because uh, mm -hmm. you thought it was going to be easy. Uh, it's it's a mixture of. Uh, you know, uh, outlaw chaos and confusion and pressure on one hand. Uh, it's a very a free environment that's accepting I mean, people with unlovely personal habits, uh, criminal histories, uh, uh, outside the kitchen doors. Inside, it's a very rigid military hierarchy. You know, you show up on time, hot food arrives hot, cold food arrives cold. Uh, you're you know, there's certain things you absolutely have to do. So it was a, a good mix of order and chaos for a but young so, man. Sometimes if you see um Chefs hanging around at the back of a restaurant, you know, they run. <laughs> <laughs> well, they generally have knives strapped to their waist, but besides that, they can be kind of dirty looking a lot of the time, big, maybe muscles, tattoos, and yeah, they, and they don't look like sort of Mr. and Mrs. Hygiene. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a popular perception, uh, you know, especially now with this uh, celebrity chef craze that, yeah. that chefs and the people who cook your food. You know, these sort of roly-poly, adorable, huggable Santa Claus types in clean white jackets with, with cute accents yeah. or, or adorable tykes like uh, Jamie Oliver. I, you know, I don't know any chefs who look like Jamie Oliver. Most chefs are cooks I know. Uh, um, you know, well, my cooks look like a Mexican prison gang, and, and you probably wouldn't want them on your property, though they cook brilliantly. So what do you think of Jamie? Um, well, he's good for business. I mean, I guess in general he's... <sighs> I find him really annoying. I, I, need, I need to take Dramamine to watch that show. I mean, motion sickness, all of that ooing and aahing and pucka tuck. I don't really get it. Yeah. No. Nah. What about A.C. Harriet? Oh, man, don't even get me started on that. <laughs> no, I said, I don't think I've ever been meaner about anything than that. I, I find, it's, I cringe watching that. Um, you've written a book, um, a, an act, a documentary book, shall we say, mm -hmm. a two. Um, Kitchen Confidential, and you mm -hmm. kind of dish the dirt, first of all on yourself and how you came up through, mm -hmm. but also on what happens in kitchens. Now, if I ask for my steak well done, what's likely to happen? Uh, well, chefs, you know, we're, we're proud of the high quality steaks we buy, and, and when you order a well done steak, we think you're asking us to ruin it. You're asking us to incinerate it into a leathery hockey puck, yeah. uh, and, and it makes us uh, cranky. I work in many restaurants, and I, I know a lot of restaurants do this. Uh, they save the nastiest, uh, most muscular, tendony, uh, oldest steaks for the people who order well-done steaks because they figure they're the least likely to notice. Uh, why waste a good piece of meat on somebody who's going to ask for their meat charred into an, an unrecognizable lump anyway? So essentially, you're paying, you're paying for the privilege of eating our garbage, and uh, we're, we're happy to oblige.